on World News Tonight. A Christmas snap. Northern Europeans brace themselves for a cold couple of weeks as the continent faces sub-zero temperatures. Closing in, Ghana prepares for a $3 billion bailout from the IMF to tackle the economic crunch. Major breakthrough. Nuclear fusion may soon be the power source of the future. And victory path. Argentines in Buenos Aires celebrate Lionel Messi and Argentina's road to FIFA World Cup finals in stunning numbers. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now much of Western and Central Europe, including the United Kingdom, will stay consistently around 5 degrees Celsius below typical values for this time of year, with many places struggling to rise above freezing even during the daytime. Change is on the horizon, however, as low pressure systems begin to enroach into Europe towards the weekend. Snow blankets parts of Europe just in time for Christmas. But with it comes traffic chaos. Cities like Lyon in France were brought to a standstill on Tuesday morning. Meteorologists say the extreme conditions have set in for the rest of the week. With freezing fog in the northeast, rain in the southwest and snow and slippery conditions in the southeast. It's a similar outlook for the rest of Europe too with temperatures set to reach as low as minus 23 degrees Celsius in Scandinavia. In London, harsh weather fell on the same day as the national rail strike, already expected to bring the country to a grinding halt. Only 20% of Britain's railway services have been in operation. But it's Northern Europe that is suffering the full brunt of the snowstorms. Air and rail traffic has been severely disrupted in Finland. Power companies have not ruled out outages due to the extent of the snowfall. Responding to pleas from President Volodymyr Zelensky to help the country withstand Russia's onslaught against its energy grid, Ukraine's Western allies pledged an additional 1 billion euros in emergency winter aid. Some 70 countries and institutions have pledged over 1.05 billion US dollars in immediate aid to help Ukraine get through a harsh winter. Russian forces have battered the country's energy grid and other critical civilian infrastructure, leaving many without essentials ahead of Ukraine's typically frigid season. France hosted a global meeting to discuss what could be offered to maintain water, food, energy, health and transport. His foreign minister, Catherine Colonna. I'm talking about efforts worth 125 million euros in total from today until late March, the end of winter, which is our contribution in this conference to urgently help the Ukrainian population to survive. By the way, with regard to our country, this is the most significant humanitarian effort that has ever been mobilized by France in such a short period in a very limited time frame. Ukrainian Prime Minister Denis Shmihal told reporters in Paris that Ukraine was grateful for that aid. I had the opportunity to meet with representatives from donor organizations. And for us in Ukraine, this is a very powerful signal to show that the whole of the civilized world is supporting Ukraine. And we're very grateful to all the countries. The conference was also an opportunity for French President Emmanuel Macron to display solidarity with Ukraine. He's been criticised by some European allies and Kiev itself over the level of French military support. And his comments about needing to maintain dialogue with Russian President Vladimir Putin. These airstrikes openly targeting the Ukrainian population and civilian infrastructure, these strikes whose Russia admitted only purpose was to undermine the Ukrainian people's resistance, amount to war crimes. They violate, without any doubt possible, the most fundamental principles of humanitarian law. These acts are unacceptable and will not remain unpunished. I want to be clear, in this context, it is up to Ukraine, the victim of the aggression, to decide on the conditions of a fair and sustainable peace. The meeting also established a mechanism for Ukraine to submit its urgent needs. Donor countries can then respond promptly. 
A second meeting between France, Ukraine and some 500 French companies will look into what can be invested to assist Kiev in the short to longer term. Poor harvests, disrupted supply lines and extra costs all added to a higher global prices for food retailers and consumers in 2022. The next 12 months look unlikely to buck that trend. Food inflation is set to spill over into 2023. Drought, too much rain, war and energy costs look set to curb global farm production again next year. Rice and wheat stores likely won't be replenished in the first half of 2023. Edible oil supplies are down because of adverse weather in Latin America and Southeast Asia. Food prices climbed to record peaks in 2022. Import costs rose to hover around a $2 trillion record high. That hit millions of people worldwide, especially those already struggling with hunger and poverty. Wheat jumped to an all-time high in March after Russia's invasion of key grain exporter Ukraine. The same was true of palm oil, while corn and soybeans climbed to a decade high. Most have since dropped back partially or fully. Flooding in Australia and severe drought in Argentina will shrink key wheat harvests and availability in coming months. And a lack of rainfall in the U.S. plains could dent supplies for the second half of the year. Rice prices are expected to remain high because of duties imposed by main exporter India. The outlook for corn and soybean harvests in South America looks largely bright in early 2023. U.S. domestic supplies of key crops are expected to remain snug, according to the Department of Agriculture. Palm oil will take a hit from tropical storms across Southeast Asia, where high costs also cut the use of fertilizer. Now, India has accused China of trying to unilaterally change the status quo on their dispute at Himalayan border after clashes in the Tawang set off India's northeastern state of Arunachal Pradesh. The Indian and Chinese governments are reporting that a recent hand-to-hand -hand fight that broke out between their troops on a disputed border wasn't a major incident, although it is the latest in a string of similar events between the two powers that have previously claimed lives. These are protests in India over the violence, burning a Chinese flag. The incident occurred on December 9th and was reported by India's ANI news agency Monday, citing sources. On Tuesday, China's foreign ministry called the border situation generally stable, and India's defense minister went before parliament to say none of the troops on either side were seriously injured. But India's home minister called the Chinese troops invaders and said so long as Prime Minister Modi's government is in power, no one will capture an inch of Indian land. The December 9th fighting took place in an area called Tawang, which is claimed by both sides. The last known clash happened two years ago, when a similar border incident saw 20 Indian soldiers and four Chinese troops killed. Skirmishes keep happening, although they aren't major. It has coincided with a decrease in relations between the countries, however. India's government has said their relationship can't go back to normal without peace on their border. The International Monetary Fund has agreed to a $3 billion loan to Ghana to get the West African nation's debt under control, restore financial stability and help people most at risk from rising prices and other economic problems. Ghana is facing more than 40% inflation, growing debt and a sharp decline in its city currency since the start of the year. Ghana expects International Monetary Fund board approval of a $3 billion three-year loan early next year, its finance minister said on Tuesday. Ken Oforiata was speaking after the West African country reached a staff-level agreement with the fund. Ghana is battling its worst economic crisis in a generation. Inflation has soared this year to a 21-year peak, while the Saudi currency has lost more than 50% of its value. That's pushed up the cost of Ghana's external debt. In July, Ghana asked the IMF for help after economic hardship prompted widespread street protests. Speaking on Tuesday, the IMF's mission chief for Ghana, Stefan Rude, said the fund's executive board will only approve the loan package if Ghana undergoes a comprehensive debt restructuring. 
Ghana's public debt was $37.4 billion in September, of which 42% was domestic debt, according to the most recent central bank figures. Aforiata said the government was ready to complete actions required of it by the end of January. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. And we have some good news for you. In an update on the successful fusion energy efforts, the United States has announced that scientists have made a breakthrough in what officials called a milestone that has the potential to one day become a boundless source of clean energy. U.S. officials said that scientists at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California had produced more energy in a fusion reaction, the process that powers the sun and the stars for the first time. This is one of the most impressive scientific feats of the 21st century. In a breakthrough that raises hopes for a clean, carbon-free future, U.S. Department of Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm announced on Tuesday that scientists at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab in California achieved nuclear fusion ignition for the first time ever. And that is creating more energy from fusion reactions than the energy used to start the process. The scientists focused lasers on a target of fuel to fuse two light atoms into a denser one to release the energy. Marv Adams, Deputy Administrator for Defense Programs at the National Nuclear Security Administration, explains. 192 laser beams entered from the two ends of the cylinder and struck the inner wall. And that happened in less time than it takes light to move 10 feet. But last week, for the first time, they designed this experiment so that the fusion fuel stayed hot enough, dense enough, and round enough for long enough that it ignited, and it produced more energies than the lasers had deposited. The director of the White House Office of Sciences and Technology Policy, Arati Prabhakar, said the breakthrough took generations to achieve. It's a century since we figured out that it was fusion that was going on in, in, in our sun and all the other stars. And in that century, it took, it took so many different kinds of advances that ultimately came together to the point that we could replicate that fusion activity in this, in this controllable way in a laboratory. Uh, and, and I think it's just a reminder that sometimes, even when we know something, it's a very long time before we can turn it into something that we can actually harness and start to be able to use. If it can make the leap from labs to commercial generation of electricity, fusion energy could help the fight to curb climate change. The director of the Lawrence Livermore Lab, Kim Budil, said commercialization is now probably much sooner than once thought. With concerted effort and investment, a few decades of research on the underlying uh, technologies uh, could put us in a position to build a power plant. Nuclear scientists outside the lab said the achievement was a major milestone, but that there is much more science to be done before fusion becomes commercially viable. The electricity industry cautiously welcomed the step, but said efforts to develop fusion should not slow down progress on other alternative energy sources, like solar and wind power, battery storage, and nuclear fission. Cryptocurrency tycoon Sam Bankman-Fried faces massive fraud accusation as U.S. prosecutors press criminal charges, which could see the former billionaire imprisoned for the rest of his life. Federal prosecutors in New York charged the founder of the crypto platform with wire fraud, conspiracy to commit fraud, money laundering, and violating campaign finance laws, amongst other charges. Federal prosecutors on Tuesday charged Sam Bankman-Fried, the 30-year-old founder of defunct cryptocurrency exchange FTX, with perpetrating what they called, quote, one of the biggest financial frauds in American history. Bankman-Fried and his co-conspirators stole billions of dollars from FTX customers. He used that money for his personal benefit, including to make personal investments and to cover expenses and debts of his hedge fund, Alameda Research. The same day, regulators with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission filed a lawsuit alleging Bankman Freed used client and investor money to enrich himself. He then misused those funds to make undisclosed venture investments, lavish real estate purchases, 
and large political donations. The criminal charges and civil lawsuits come a day after Bankman Freed was arrested at his home in Nassau, Bahamas, on a U.S. warrant. He appeared in a Bahamas court on Tuesday with his attorneys indicating the former CEO might fight extradition to the U.S. Bankman Freed has apologized to customers and acknowledged oversight failings at FTX, but said he does not personally think he has any criminal liability. Before his arrest, Bankman Freed was scheduled to testify before U.S. lawmakers on the House Financial Services Committee. The hearing went ahead with FTX's new CEO, John Ray, as the main witness. The FTX group's collapse appears to stem from absolute concentration of control in the hands of a small group of grossly inexperienced and unsophisticated individuals. Ray was tapped to lead the defunct exchange last month and oversee the bankruptcy. He told members of Congress that FTX lost $8 billion of client money and said he'd never seen a firm with so few internal controls or so little oversight. Uh, they use QuickBooks, a multi-billion dollar company using QuickBooks. QuickBooks? QuickBooks. Uh, nothing against QuickBooks, very nice tool, just not for a multi-billion dollar company. The U.S. Congress is looking at crafting legislation to rein in a loosely regulated crypto industry. FTX filed for bankruptcy on November 11th, leaving an estimated 1 million customers and other investors facing losses in the billions of dollars. The collapse reverberated across the crypto world and sent Bitcoin and other digital assets plummeting. Peru's armed forces will take control of the protection of key infrastructure, its defense minister said, as protesters that have led to at least six deaths continue across the country following the ousting of its former president. Peru's new president, Dina Boluarte, had earlier in the day pledged to work with Congress to see if the next election could be held sooner than previously proposed and pleaded for calm. Growing unrest in Peru after violent protests erupted over the weekend. A human rights group in Peru reporting at least six people have died in clashes just days after the ouster of former President Pedro Castillo last week impeached and arrested for rebellion and conspiracy while separately facing corruption charges. His vice president, Dina Buluarte, has since been sworn in as president, including a new cabinet that includes an anti-corruption pledge. But protesters are now calling for presidential elections to be moved up and held as soon as possible. The deadly demonstrations are the latest in a tumultuous week for Latin America. Government officials from four different countries facing corruption charges. Just last Tuesday, Argentina's vice president, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, sentenced to six years in prison and barred from holding public office again. A day later, a Guatemalan court sentencing both former President Otto Perez and his vice president, Roxana Valdetti, to 16 years in prison after corruption revelations forced the two out of office early. The former president says he will appeal. And over the weekend, a Panamanian judge summoned former President Ricardo Martinelli to stand trial for money laundering. Martinelli maintains his innocence and claims he's being politically targeted. A struggle for transparency and a battle against corruption underway. At least 120 people have been killed and dozens injured in widespread floods and landslides caused by torrential rain in the Democratic Republic of Congo's capital, Kinshasa. Entire neighborhoods were flooded with muddy waters and houses and roads ripped apart by sinkholes and landslides, including the, the N1 highway that connects Kinshasa to the country's main seaport of Matadi. A community in mourning after nine members of the same family died when their house collapsed. Monday night, heavy rains hit the Congolese capital of Kinshasa and its surroundings, killing dozens of people. We woke up around 4.15 in the morning when the water entered the house. At some point, there was no more danger, so we went back to bed. And shortly afterwards, the ground collapsed on the children and the parents, as well as on a neighbor who was passing by. The disaster took place on National Road 1 that connects Kinshasa to the river port of Matadi, a generally busy highway which is essential to the supply of the city and its surroundings. 
We are on the National Road 1 of Matadi. Everyone passes through here, the traders. Now we will suffer. We will not be able to send goods or fuel to Kinshasa. Officials said they were working to reopen the road. Kinshasa and its surroundings suffer from poor urban planning, which can exacerbate the impacts of extreme weather. In 2019, around 40 people died following heavy rains and landslides. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. New Zealand passed a package of new anti-smoking laws that bans its youth from purchasing tobacco products. The legislation will also reduce the amount of nicotine allowed in smoked tobacco products and cut the number of retailers able to sell tobacco by 90% from 6,000 to 600 by the end of 2023. The U.S. government agreed to pay Pfizer, Inc. nearly $2 billion for an additional 3.7 million courses of its COVID-19 antiviral treatment Paxlovid. This new purchase supplements the 20 million courses previously bought by the United States and delivery is planned by early 2023. Joe Biden is expected to announce U.S. support for the African Union's admission to the G20 as a permanent member and touted support for food security and climate change. France trained Doha as they edge closer to the World Cup semi-finals against giant killers Morocco. While the 2018 champions will be tested by the resolute defence of the Arab country, they have the tournament's most potent goal scorer in their side, Kylian Mbappe. A major winter storm pounded the heart of the United States, bringing heavy snow and freezing rain to the northern plains and grounding truckers in Nebraska. And that is all from us at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Now, Argentine fans were ecstatic after the national team's victory against Croatia in Qatar's FIFA World Cup. Thousands gathered in Buenos Aires' Oblesk post-match to celebrate wearing Argentina's jersey, sang songs and cheered. Argentina beat Croatia 3-0 on Tuesday in the World Cup semi-finals, with Messi moving closer to his last World Cup game. Again, thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.